This video is brought to you by Captivating History. The Pilgrims hold a special spot in American culture. Every November, school children make turkey tracings with their hands. Thanksgiving performances are put on about the Pilgrims and the Mayflower. Everyone looks forward to feasting and seeing their families. But there's much more to them than is often discussed during the holiday season. The Pilgrims started across the ocean in England to escape religious persecution intending to make the new colony in Maryland. Blown off course, they landed in Cape Cod, New England. They would go on to establish Plymouth Colony and make their indelible mark in American history, with Plymouth Rock growing in legend around dinner tables every year. Let's delve into the full story about who the Pilgrims were and how they got here. What made the Pilgrims want to leave for a new world in the first place? Their relocation, in part, can be traced back to the strict English rules making it illegal not to be a part of the Church of England. A small group of separationists would meet in Nottinghamshire, England, wanting to practice their own faith separate from the Central Church of England. But the Act of Uniformity of 1559 made it illegal not to attend church service at the Church of England, finding those missing attendance. Under increasing stress from the government and the Church of England, they decided that they would have to leave if they wanted to practice their faith. This would prove difficult. To leave legally, they had to sign documents saying why they were leaving, gain royal approval from the king, and state that they intended to return. Since they couldn't do that, they had to be smuggled out, which they were to do with the assistance of various Dutch captains. Their first choice for the colony was in Holland, which was full of Protestants. They initially settled in Amsterdam but that city proved too big and not the right fit. So, they landed in Leiden, Holland, and for a time it worked. Some people found jobs and supported themselves, but others had trouble adjusting. Some gave up and went back to England. The leaders of the faith grew worried that others would follow suit and go back to their old lives. Many found that working conditions in Leiden's textile industry was unbearable. The former farmers lived in poverty, laboring long hours for low pay making it difficult to convince fellow separationists to join them in Holland. William Branford related, Some preferred and chose the prisons in England rather than this liberty in Holland with these afflictions. But things were going to get worse. The collapse of the wool market, the Thirty Years' War, and the upcoming end to a 12-year truce between the Dutch Republic and Spain turned their safe haven into an unsettling fight for survival. Adding to that, the separatists worried that the same tolerant Dutch society they ran to was corrupting their family morals. Their children were turning away from the church and their English identity. Again, Bradford wrote that many of their children were succumbing to Leiden's manifold temptations and being drawn away by evil examples into extravagant and dangerous courses. Thus, many thoughts of a better place swirled in the separatists' mind. They knew they couldn't go back to England because of religious reasons. So they considered the New World, where English merchants had been financing colonial settlements for decades. They felt they could worship freely and find economic stability while preserving their English identity and religious morals. Evangelical ideas also called them across the Atlantic. Bradford wrote, The propagating and advancing the gospel of the kingdom of Christ in those remote parts of the world was part of the draw to America. Lastly, there was the possibility of a monetary enterprise. After receiving a patent from the Virginia Company to establish a settlement in its American jurisdiction, the Merchant Adventurers, a group of 70 businessmen from London, paid for the Mayflower, its crew, and a year's worth of supplies. The Pilgrims had found their way, their passage, to America. But it was not just a passage. Their benefactors required the Pilgrims to work for them for the first seven years in America, with each colonist over the age of 16 receiving one share of the company for emigrating and working the land. Pilgrims would also retain any future profits after the seven-year contract expired. Their plans and futures set, the Pilgrims set out for their American journey on July 21, 1620, initially sailing on the Speedwell, but that ship proved unseaworthy. It was ultimately the Mayflower that would bring the Pilgrims to the New World. It was an arduous journey of 65 days before they spotted land on November 9, 1620. There was a spot of brightness during that terrible time. Susanna White gave birth to the first baby born on this trip, a boy named Peregrine. Once land was seen, they determined they were in New England, pulling into the port of Plymouth. On November 11, 1620, the Pilgrims set foot on American land. 
It would be a while before they made contact with the natives, but they saw their cook fires and other traces of them around. They found their corn and beans and took them, thinking they would repay them once they were established. They finally set themselves up on what is now Plymouth Colony. Working tirelessly throughout the winter was very difficult. They lacked the manpower to build quickly, and many fell gravely ill. In January and February of 1621, many of the pilgrims died and were buried in unmarked graves. There had been limited contact with the natives until Samoset. On March 16, 1621, a man boldly walked up to the common house and introduced himself as Samoset, speaking in English. He welcomed them, explained he was from the Abenaki tribe, and was a chieftain. He also said he learned English from the fishermen and trappers up in Maine, where he came from. He elaborated a bit on his visit. The great chief of the Wampanoag Confederacy, Massasoit, wanted to meet with them to discuss an alliance for protection against another confederation, the Narragansetts. Samoset gave them a few days to think about it. He returned a few more times with Pelts and other natives who wanted to trade with them. Samoset also introduced them to Squanto, kidnapped by the Spanish and brought to Spain to be a slave. Miraculously, he made his way to England and was able to return to his home, only to find that his whole village had been ravaged by a smallpox plague and was emptied out when he returned. Squanto spoke fluent English because of those unfortunate events and had been taken in by Massasoit after explaining his situation. Squanto told the pilgrims how tensions were difficult. Other Englishmen had slain Massasoit's people after a false welcome, but he recognized the need to form alliances with other English people. Squanto offered to become a liaison between Massasoit and the English. On March 22, 1621, in Plymouth Colony, Massasoit came to meet with Governor John Carver. Squanto translated during these negotiations, and an agreement was made. The colonists would pay for the food they had taken from the natives the previous winter, and the natives would return some of the tools they had taken from the colonists. They also agreed there would be no visible weapons when meeting with each other, and if any crimes or offenses were made, they would be arbitrated between the two parties. If another party attacked, they would have each other's back. This treaty would ultimately last 50 years, and both parties left the negotiations satisfied. Squanto and Samoset's aid didn't end there. They stayed behind to help the pilgrims learn how to grow food and flourish in that environment. They taught the pilgrims how to grow peas, corn, barley, and learned how to catch eels, which became a yearly pilgrim tradition. They were taught how to collect pelts, use fish as manure, and took them on expeditions in the surrounding areas to show them how to live and survive in the area. Squanto and William Bradford, a notable colonist who later was governor, became close, and Bradford would heed Squanto's advice in the coming years. The first Thanksgiving would be celebrated that year in October 1621. Edward Winslow, a leader in the separatist movement, had come over on the Mayflower and was one of the leader of the separationists. And what we know of the first Thanksgiving is thanks to his writings. Relations with the natives were good, and the pilgrims owed a lot to Squanto and Samoset. The pilgrims had a three-day celebration with their native neighbors, with over 91 members of the Wampanoag tribe and 53 pilgrims coming together to feast. At first, the pilgrims were worried about having enough food, but the natives came with plenty of deer, lobster, fish, crops, and berries. There was enough for all. It wasn't until 1863, during Abraham Lincoln's presidency, that this would become a national holiday. A year after their arrival, the pilgrims received word from their benefactors, who were not happy that they hadn't officially signed their contract before departing and that the pilgrims sent the Mayflower back empty of cargo as a repayment of debt. The pilgrims hurriedly signed the contract, wanting to assemble cargo to send back immediately. The governor wrote back saying that many had died. The pilgrims had worked tirelessly through an extremely difficult winter and their lives were worth more than profit. The pilgrims still wanted to send back goods and came up with pelts and other riches, enough to cover half of their debt. But a French ship intercepted the fortune on the way back, robbing them of their cargo, though it did allow the letter to be delivered. This set the pilgrims even heavier in debt, but they continued tirelessly on, repaying their debt in full. The Puritans came not long after the pilgrims and flourished. Within a generation, the pilgrims melded with them, with the Quakers arriving not long after. Despite their small members, their values of freedom, free choice, community, 
as well as their tenacity in terms of living through that first harsh winter, have been emulated in today's American culture. To this day, we still honor and follow many of their ideologies. To learn more about the Pilgrims, check out our book, The Pilgrims, a captivating guide to the passengers on board the Mayflower who founded the Plymouth Colony and their relationship with the Native Americans along with their legacy in New England. It's available as an ebook, paperback, and audiobook. Also, grab your free Mythology Bundle ebook while it's still available. All links are in the description. If you enjoyed the video, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.